the aim is, is as you know, we're a multi-star school. So therefore, what's going to happen is Richard's going to be going through um, basically the game, how you, um, the rule set, how you can win, and go through some techniques with you. All right, but the main aim today is basically give you an idea of what it is in order to win a grappling competition or to win an MMA competition, how it's actually scored. And um, quarter past 12, we cover MMA in Cravenga on a Saturday, so come down for that. All right, guys.
kind of guy that's uh, a nightmare for me. That's one of the foundation manoeuvres in the Jiu Jitsu is twisters, but you're not allowed to manipulate the spine. Um, even just uh, like the cranking of the neck this way, you're not allowed, which means that a lot of the chokes when you come under the, underneath the chin makes it a choke. When it comes across the shoulder, it starts turning the head, it becomes a neck crank, so the amateur generally don't allow that. There may be some variation at um, top level amateur, but again, that's something that the promotion would be informed of. Okay, so that's your uh, professional level. So then we go to A class, B class, and C class. So A class obviously is the highest level of amateur working its way down to C. So uh, A class is for the most part exactly the same as the unified rules of the professional ranks, but with no elbows. Okay? So you will be allowed headshot standing, headshots on the ground, um, all punching, kicking techniques, all major submissions, but depending on the promotion they will probably take away the neck cranks again. Um, Again, this could be potential of damage on the wall on those work in this way. As always, maybe some slight variation with the promotion, but as a rule, that's the only rule difference is the lack of elbows. Okay? So now we move down to B class. So this now um, becomes more for the slightly inexperienced fighters. There's a lot of guys that are adults will enter at this level. Um, usually, but not always, the C class they teach the kids, but sometimes as well, but we'll go through that. So the big difference now with A class and B class is once the floor hits the ground, you cannot strike the head. That's the uh, major difference for the B class. Okay, so stood up, all the same. So you can use the punches, you can use kicks and you can knees to the head, that's not a problem. Again, still no elbows, but once the bite hits the floor, you can only strike from here down. Okay, so that's your B class. Um, C class, which is your entry level amateur, uh, which usually they reserve for the children, um, but not always, sometimes um, they'll give it to novice fighters that are fighting for the first time, um, when they interview by both fighters, and sometimes tournaments use this one, um, simply because as a tournament, if you have to fight more than one fight, you maybe have three, four, five fights in one day, if you get a concussion in the first fight, but you could still win that fight, that would mean that you've potentially got to fight two, three or four more times with a concussion. Yeah. So for that reason, sometimes the tournaments remove the headshots just to keep everybody safe. Okay? But usually, like I say, the C-class, they'll keep for the kids. Even if they, if they have a fight show where they put them in the cage, they'll still keep that as another headshot. Part. So that's a difference to the, um, the C-class. There's no headshots at all. Okay? The only other real difference between the classes is the type of gloves that you wear. So usually there are two types of gloves, there's the four ounce gloves and the seven ounce gloves. Um, professional level will always be the four ounce gloves, which are often the smaller ones, again, the sort of gloves you see them wearing in Bellator of the USC. Now amateur A class usually will insist on the seven ounce gloves. Okay? The reason being they can do the ground and pound on the floor to the head, so they have a slightly bigger glove just to keep them uh, a little bit safer because they're amateurs and can touch their work. Okay, because obviously the smaller gloves you're going to get more damage, more chance of cuts, all that kind of stuff, more chance of concussions. So um, they tend to favour the, um, the bigger gloves for um, A class. B class, usually they'll go back to the four rounds gloves because you can't do the head strikes on the ground. Okay? Some, uh, some tournaments or, um, or promoters will allow you the choice of four rounds or seven rounds um, because Really, there's no benefit to you having the seven ounce gloves in B class, um, but some people just prefer it because they just want to really, you know, they, they give you handful more protection as well, but they do make it more difficult to grapple in because they're thinking so. Some will allow that choice to you, um, and then C class is almost exclusively always the smaller gloves um, because you can't he headshot at all, so there's no real benefit to wearing the big gloves at all because obviously the body shots can, you can take a bit more of those. And, um, so that's essentially that's all. You, that's your four rule sets. Okay. There may be occasion where, particularly with the children, um, they will uh, make you wear shin and instep pads. Um, but also sometimes at the tournaments as well, just again because you might have to fight two, three, four times, um, just for that little bit of extra security. But that will depend on the promotion of the tournaments. 
So the biggest takeaway is always, if you know you're going to be competing, wherever it is you're going to be competing, or for whoever you're going to be competing, make sure you get as much notice of their rule set as you can, because then that means when you come to the gym and you're training for it, then you can be training under the rules that you need to fight. Because there's nothing worse than um, always in the gym you're training like if it's A class, you go for a B class fight, and then also you get the squad fight in the pocket in the head with the ground, because it's not so try and always recreate in your training what you're going to be doing. Okay, and obviously the more notice you have of doing that, the more chance you've got of being successful when you need it. Okay, make sense? Mm -hmm. Any questions on any of the rounds? Um, usually in terms of round time, again, professional will usually be three five minute rounds, but the amateur ones usually move down to three minutes, um, three three minute rounds, and then uh, children they usually move to two minutes. And that may be two or three minutes, but again, that will depend on um, the Okay, yeah. Uh, you mentioned the fact that when a person is on the ground, mm -hmm. you cannot uh, uh, hit him. And uh, just from there to there. So, A class and professional, yeah. you, can, you can hit the head professional uh, and A class. Yeah. But when you move to B class, they will allow it standing up, you can punch the head. Yeah. But when it hits the floor, yeah. it's only. Yeah, so down. okay, so lean on the floor just yeah. from that. Okay. Uh, and usually, and usually they will class you as a downed opponent. Now, um, again, the rules on this for the professionals have changed fairly recently, within maybe the last year or so. But the old rule used to be, if anything other than the soles of your feet was touching the floor, you were classed as being down. So, for example, if I'm here, mm -hmm. if I'm like this, I'm still a standing opponent. Mm -hmm. As soon as that goes down, even though I haven't changed position. Yeah. Yeah, there's something other than the sole of my foot touching the floor, I'm now be classed as a downed opponent. Okay. Um, so therefore, as soon as that happens, as soon as I'm classed as down, no headshots to be classed as below. Mm. Okay? So the variation on this has come from uh, what used to happen uh, a lot of the time. Uh, so what would happen a lot of the time was when they, uh, they would have a hole in the head in this kind of a position, okay? and uh, to avoid the knees coming in here, what would happen is this guy would touch his finger. Uh, <laughs> this guy would touch his fingertips to the floor. Yeah, because now technically he was a downed opponent, and I couldn't, I couldn't use those knees anymore. Yeah, so that's the uh, uh, sorry, professional level even. Yeah, as soon as those fingertips touch the floor, old rules were um, there is that's not the sole of his foot, so he's downed opponent. And I couldn't do it anymore. Yeah, but it got to the point where that became the game now, where it's like he was just kind of doing that, and then I couldn't, and then sometimes what would happen was. Uh, I would bring him up, and then I would go for the knee, and then that would happen, then I'd get disqualified because I caught him with the knee, and in that transition, his hand going up and down. Yeah, so, uh, what they said, they changed it, and you must have um, uh, weight bearing on the thing that's touching the floor. Yeah, so this isn't, yeah, but this is, because okay. my weight is on, on the arm, yeah. So, um, what happened? Thank you. So, um, that became more about a referee issue, a referee talking, talking, talking to the guy with notices. So uh, if you watch a good referee, they'll be t if you're in that sort of a position, they'll be guiding you through, saying, you can't knee him, you can't knee him, you can knee him, you can knee him. And they'll let you know that, because they know the positions, they mm. know um, when you can and when you can't, and obviously they don't want people getting the sports behind as well. Okay? Perfect. Cheers. Anything else? Any other questions? Um, the only other thing as well that you might get with um, some competitions as well and uh, amateur level is a lot of places don't like twisting leg locks as well. So what they will allow is it's, it's just a technique. So um, if, the, if the leg stays in the shape, in, okay, then it's a legal technique. So for example, if I have, and I'm not going to lock it up, but if I have this one where I'm working the ankle this way, okay, this is legal. Yeah? If I'm working for like a knee bar, square with this way, because the knee is uh, the leg is still straight, okay, this was legal. Yeah. So what they didn't like, because of the potential of damaging the knee and the ankle, it is going <coughs> was things like um, heel hooks. Okay, so with the heel hook what happens is just hold on to your side for me so I can demonstrate something. So see how the leg is now bent? And now the pressure comes because this comes underneath and now I'm trying to force the knee down and the heel up so you see how you get that little that rotation in here and in here. Okay? Now the reason that they don't like that is because a lot of the time uh, 
particularly it was happening with the ladies, because the ladies naturally had a higher pain threshold than us men, mm -hmm. what would happen is the manoeuvre wasn't hurting enough that they needed to tap. Yeah, they could handle the pain a bit, but the joint couldn't take the pressure. So they weren't needing to tap because it wasn't hurting enough, but then all of a sudden, bang, the ankles and the uh, ligaments and everything would just get ripped out, and then that was them um, not walking for the next year whilst they recovered. Yeah. So um, usually professionals, they allow it because that's the price, you've had, that's your choice, that's how you earn your living. But for most amateur shows and tournaments, they won't allow any sort of manoeuvre that involves twisting the leg into that submission for that reason, so they don't get that sort of injury. Okay, make sense? Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's in terms of the rules. So some things that you need to be aware of whilst you're competing is um, the referee, his primary concern is the safety of the two fighters that are competing. Okay? Um, everything else is kind of by the by. It's their job to keep you safe, keep you out of hospital. So, uh, when I'm refereeing, I always explain to the guys beforehand that it's very important if the referee is talking to you that you respond to him. Okay? So, if, uh, and this will usually be in the grappling exchanges because you can't always have a clear vision um, when they've got a hold across your face and you, you can't necessarily see everything that's going on, you, know, you close your eyes as you're wincing and stuff like that, but is he asleep or is he not asleep or whatever. So I always say to the guys when I'm, uh, when I'm refereeing, if I talk to you, reply. Now I don't care how that is, so if you're, and it will usually be the person that's on the bottom because usually they're the person that's in the, in the predicament, um, but if, um, if I ask you a question, I need a response and you can respond any way that you want. It can be, you can just say, yep, yeah, I'm fine. You can give a thumbs up, um, a little cheeky wink to say that everything's okay. As long as you're getting a response from that fighter, then there's a reason to allow the fight to continue. But at any point, if you ask that fighter a question and they don't respond, straight away, it's up the fight. And then you can argue with the toss up after, I was fine, I was fine. Well, you didn't tell me you were fine, so to keep you safe, I've got to stop the fight. Okay? So that's something to bear in mind when you're competing always be in communication with the referee and don't just allow him to make the decision for you. And on a similar note, um, and again, not so much a problem with the professionals, I don't even know if they're at that level yet, um, so where it's not so much of an issue, but certainly in the amateur ranks, um, if there is a position that you are, and usually you'll find it'll be in like an arm bar position, yeah? especially if it's an arm bar where they're on the bottom and you're on the top and they pop the hips up, is quite often that arm starts to go out straight and then you'll hear ah like that. Now they haven't tapped, they haven't given up, but at that point, me usually as a referee, I will stop the fight then. Because what you're doing is you're saying your arm is in a position where it could break and you're shouting out in pain. To me that's a verbal submission. Yeah? If you don't want the referee to stop it, you keep your mouth shut. Yeah? Because how do I know that's you've not screamed because your arm's broken. Yeah? So again bear that in mind that always the referee is to keep you safe. And so if you, if you, and bear that in mind as well, because a lot of the time, when, the, when you're under the pressure of the fight, um, and you think you shouldn't have, they shouldn't have stopped the fight because you were fine, there was no problem, just always remember before people, because what happened is, and, you know, people start getting mad and start arguing with the referee or the opponent or the opponent's coach has happened sometimes. Just bear in mind, the reason they've stopped it is because they don't want you going to the hospital. So always just try and in that situation, if it happens, just keep a calm head. It's like, okay, it was stopped for a reason, I don't agree with it, but I know the reason why you did it as well. Just bear that in mind as well. Because it's very, very rare that the referee rooting against you. It's not that they want you to lose, it's that they're doing the best job that they can to stop you getting injured. Okay? Any other questions? No? So, that's in terms of like what you can and can't do, really. So, in terms of the scoring, now the scoring in MMA often comes under criticism. It's, um, it's very subjective. Now what I'll, you tend to find is the discipline, that the, ref, oh, sorry, the discipline that the judge is from will dictate what they consider to be the most important part of the fight. So if you've got a, an MMA coach, as an MMA judge, and his background is tie boxing, he is probably going to consider the striking part more important than the wrestling part. Yeah? So, if you've got a guy that spends, you know, land, he maybe lands, I don't know, through the course of the round, 20 really good strikes, yeah? but for the last minute, the guy who's, not, who's been outstruck lands a takedown and starts working his ground game. Now, 
if you're a, a wrestling guy or a jiu-jitsu guy, you maybe say, well, he's dominated him for that last minute, he's controlled him, he's held him down. Of course that's his round. But if you're controlling what your opponent does, so you're not just receiving the shots, you're, and, you know, or sending the shots, what you're doing is you're saying, okay, I know I, I'm doing what I want to do and you cannot stop me from doing what I want to do. So for that reason, like the wrestlers with, or with the takedown usually scores quite high. What that means is once they're on top, for most referees, that top position is winning the fight because um, they're on top of controlling the position. Now, it's very, very rare, but it is possible that you can maybe outstrike them from the bottom and win that way, or you just go in submission, 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 submission attempt to get the win that way. But usually, even if you're working your ass off on the bottom, usually the guy on top is still going to win the fight in that position. Okay? Now again, if the guy has been winning the stand-up for four minutes and the guy on the you know, ground one minute, then maybe it goes, but it's, it's very hard, there's, it's very difficult. There's no hard and fast rule where five strikes is equal to one takedown. It doesn't work like that. It's what the referee, or sorry, what the judge feels was most important. And a lot of the time it comes down as well to who was, uh, certainly for me, if I think, if there is a guy that um, he's dominating the stand-up, absolutely dominating it, but he's landing the shots like this all the time. There's no big bang, you know. It's just like, he keeps on tapping, 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 chipping away at him. He's winning the fight because he's landing more strikes, yeah. So it's simple martial arts competition, um, you know, the, the law. If, if you hit them more than they hit you, you win the fight. That's simple mathematics, yeah. But when it comes to the takedown side, or the, the grappling side of it, Let's say that you've done your, your four minutes of tap, 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 and then it ends up on the floor. The guy on the floor, maybe he's lost that first four minutes, but he's, all, he's come this close to getting the rear naked choke and making the guy pass out and then the bell goes. Well, the guy that was doing the stand-up was never in a position where he was going to stop the fight. Yeah? He was just scoring points, point, 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 point. But there was never a point where the guy was nearly unconscious. Yeah? So does that four minutes of tap, tap, tap equal... 30 seconds where the guy's nearly unconscious. Well, for me as a judge, he's, he's nearly won the fight by choking him out unconscious. So that is closer to winning the fight than the tap, tap, tap was. But that's, that's subjective. So it's you know, the old thing that you know, they always say in the UFC, never leave it in the hands of the judges. It's because it is that subjective. It's very hard to, you know, and, and you, can make it, you can always make a case for, well, he, I said that because of that, and I said that because that. There's always a case for it. You just have to hope that the case falls on your side. Um, which is why, for me, I mean, I, I, like, I prefer to win by submission. I like the submissions because um, they, they, <laughs> it's for my ego more than anything. Because if you knock them out, they, they haven't made that choice. You've caught them with a cracking shot and they've gone down and that's the end of the fight. The thing I like about submissions is they're admitting that I'm better than they are. Because yeah, they're like, yeah, okay then, okay, you win, you're better than me. So for me, I like the submissions for that. It's just an ego thing. Um, but, you know, so it's always best to try and finish, always, always, always. But not always possible, and then you've just got to hope that the judges see what you do is the more impressive thing for your opponent. That's, that's all you can do. But, um, the, the, be the best bit of advice, really, in terms of that, for, for me, is work rate. Yeah? If you're working harder than the guy you're fighting, you're winning the fight. It doesn't matter where you are or what you're doing. If you're working harder than they are, then you, you're winning. Yeah? So if you're out punching them, if you're out wrestling them, if you're out trying to submit them, you're going to win the fight. Yeah? It's, the lazy guy doesn't win. Yeah? So, um, in terms of your you training and your competing, um, that's the mentality to get into. It's all, you know, always be the hardest worker in the, in the room. Kind of thing, you know? if, you're, if you're going 110 miles an hour and your opponent's going 120 miles an hour, who's going to win the fight? Yeah? So, um, so always work rate for me is the biggest thing. Work rate, work, 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 work. Um, and then that's it really. Um, you know, either you get the submission, you get the knockout, or you'll outpoint them. Yeah? They can't win the fight if they if you hit them more than they hit you, because that's simply not moments. Yeah? So any questions on uh, anything that I've said so far? Cool. Right, anything you want to add or go through or ask? No, I think it's, it's great. It's great yeah. insight. Um, so if uh, so, what we'll do? We'll have a little warm up, um, and then we'll get working through some drills and skills. But as you're doing anything, if anything that we've dis I've discussed so far, um, 
pops into your head or you're thinking about it or running it over or any of it sort of like then becomes relevant to what we're doing or anything, don't be afraid to ask. Um, if it's something like just for you to know, then I'll just talk to you about it. If it's something I think that we'll all get a benefit from discussing, then we'll set you down again and then we'll go through those things that, that pop up as we go through it. Okay? Happy with that? Yeah. Yep. Okay, so um, I spoke to Wayne about what um, he wanted me to cover today. Um, and aside from that, it's, it's pretty much left up to me, but I'll give you the option. Um, what I'll do, um, because obviously I know um, Wayne's focus more is striking arts, um, so I'll, I'll not try to interfere with what he does in terms of his, uh, his kickboxing, his Muay Thai, whatever, I'll leave that to him. Um, but what we can do is we'll work on the grappling side, um, but you've got the choice if you want, with, by a show of hands, we'll work on um, wrestling, by which I mean stand up to the ground, or we can work on jiu-jitsu stuff from the ground. Um, so, show of hands for the wrestling. One, two, three, four, five, six, and shut, six, seven. Yeah. Hands up, clearly, clearly, right up in the air, don't be shy. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And for groundwork. One, <laughs> two, three, four. Done. So we'll do some wrestling drills then, okay? And what I'll do for those of you that want a bit of grappling is I'll show you a few transitions into some submissions off the wrestling then. Okay? Happy with that? Yep. Okay, so if you need a quick drink before we start, grab it. Um, and then we'll have a quick warm-up. Do you suggest any gaps?